Welcome again to Hidden Meanings. Um, what we've done is present evidence about the um, Emerald Tablet. And I, and I haven't proved anything. I haven't tried to prove anything. I haven't changed anything. I haven't tried to do that. But simply what we've done is, is try to open our minds to things that the system, the culture, and religion declares to be off limits. And and that's that's really an, an interesting thing because what we've done by daring to go to these places is develop evidence which can affect a deep change in in what we consider to be our spiritual lives. Um, these are the things now that that we found. Okay, and this is a, I guess what you'd call a real quick synopsis. We found the emerald tablet, thirty thousand years old. Okay, story of an alien force coming to the earth in UFOs and confronting prehistoric people. Now this is what is written in this document. All right. In the physical confrontation, we found the aliens to be using laser weapons or ray guns. We found that the Emerald Tablet described the reason for the aliens coming to Earth was to bring civilization and light to those primitives living on the Earth. And we found that the aliens then scattered their forces in many geographical directions so that they could work with Earthlings wherever they found them. In addition, we found that the Emerald Forces came upon the Mayans in South America and actually buried the Emerald Tablet under the Pyramid of the Sun. And this connected the Emerald to December the 21st, 2012. We found that Paco Votan, who we initially considered to be a Mayan, was portrayed by the Mayans in a carving depicting him as someone piloting a UFO. We connected the alien Toth with Jesus Christ in statements both made being very, very similar. We also connected the alien Toth with Jesus in symbols both used of the cross and of the single eye. And we connected alien forces who arrived in UFOs in the biblical book of Ezekiel with the same forces that arrived in the Emerald Tablets. This was done by noting that Toth carried an inkhorn by his side and the book of Ezekiel referring to one of the aliens from the UFOs as carrying an inkhorn by his side. We connected the Old Testament Elijah as one of the forces of the emerald as he is portrayed as leaving the earth in the Bible, leaving the earth in a UFO. And in addition, we showed the Bible describing Elijah as calling down fire from above, which represented UFO weaponry. We connected Jesus to the emerald as he was a close friend of John the Baptist that Jesus knew was the previously mentioned Elijah who had flown in a UFO and was obviously part of the emerald. This provided evidence that since Jesus was a close friend with an alien who flew in a UFO, he himself, in my opinion, more than likely was part of the same emerald force. And we connected the tetrahedron, which Toth holds in his right hand, with photon, which is the subatomic essence of light the Bible describes as the nature of God. So that's where we are. And we're just opening the second tablet. You know, we, we, we've, we've just almost pulled everything that we've ever read, almost everything that's ever been written, and it seems like we've been able to connect it to this force that came to the Earth in an extremely prehistoric time. Don't forget this force of UFOs, or whatever they were, landed on the earth before there was an Egypt. There, there was no such thing as Egypt. They called it the land of Chem. Okay. So the crucial evidence that 
I believe, is first finding the emerald forces arriving in UFOs. I mean, it, you know, they were objects, they fly, and nobody knew what they were, so that's a UFO. And then in the Bible, finding UFOs landing in the book of Ezekiel, and then a biblical guy by the name of Elijah gets into a UFO, takes off, and turns out to be a close friend of Jesus Christ. Now, does this mean that Jesus is an alien who came in a UFO? Well, you would have to ask your pastor on Sunday morning. And I'm like, don't do that. Many would call that blasphemy. Jesus, an alien, coming in a UFO? Well, what did Jesus say? Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. I would say that makes him an alien. I mean, however you want to call it, most people just want to believe that he's from heaven, but that's not a real place. It's some kind of a hocus pocus. But wonder if he is saying that his dwelling place is not here, it's someplace else in the universe, making him an alien. And not only does he say, my kingdom is not of this world, his close friend is a guy who took off in a UFO, then came back and became John the Baptist. He knew him. And I mean, if Jesus knew him, he had to know that he was a UFO guy. Now, of course, when he says, my kingdom is not of this world, he could have been talking of some spiritual thing. You know, if you go to church, they'll say, Oh, it's not of this world. It's some heavenly place. Yeah, which would mean it's not emerald forces. And that could be true. That could be true. But listen, be reasonable. You're grown up, you're intelligent, you're mature. <laughs> and all we're doing here is trying to fit pieces of a puzzle together. I'm not saying anything for you to believe. Who cares? But we're trying to put the pieces of a puzzle together and see how interesting it gets. You know, if, if, in other words, if, if you take one and put another one, you get two. And then if you take two and put another two, you get four. And if you, you know, we're just putting pieces together. Now, Jesus and the guy from the Emerald Tablet say the same thing. They're both connected with the cross and a single eye. And Toth came here in a UFO and Jesus had a close friend who traveled in a UFO. So, you know, being reasonable, it leads me to conclude that at the very least, uh, these people, you know, were involved in some kind of liftoffs and rockets and all of this other stuff, because that's what it says. Toth, or Hermes, whatever you want to call him, the alien is more suitable to me, said his location was in another celestial place. And Jesus says, my kingdom is not of this world. So they're both aliens. Okay? Just think of that for a minute. Both of them say that they don't come from here. Okay? Now, the top guy, he came in a UFO. The Jesus guy, he knew a guy who came in a UFO. Or left in a UFO. So since Jesus was friends with a space traveler, Elijah, and preached the same thing as space traveler Toth, one is led to consider the possibility. That's all. Just consider the possibility that Jesus was a space traveler connected to the emerald. Especially since he says that, you know, his location is not at this one. Now, just for a minute, consider the one that we know as John the Baptist. First of all, that's ridiculous because, Albert, there's nobody in Palestine named John. All right? You, the only John you'll ever find is the men's room. But, I mean, other than that, there's nobody by the name of John. But the last time this guy was seen on the earth, he was called Elijah. He never died. 
And the last time he's seen on the earth, according to the Bible, he's in a UFO, which they call a fiery chariot. He didn't die. He didn't reincarnate. He left in a UFO, came back to earth with this other name, and he's proclaiming the coming of Jesus, which has to mean that Jesus was part of the same force as Elijah, the spaceman. Get this. My name is Elijah, and I'm leaving, and I'm going up in space to get further instructions from Captain Kirk. Lift off. Boom. Off he goes. Now, the next thing we hear about him, here's a guy named John, and according to Jesus, that's the guy, Elijah, that took off in the UFO. Gee. And what is the guy who took off in the UFO in his back saying now? Prepare the way for this guy. What's that all about? So the guy that came back in the UFO points to Jesus and said, prepare the way for this guy. Did the guy in the UFO go up to the other galaxy or planet? And they said, hey, uh, look, go back there. You're going to take another name. And you set it up for, you know, what's his name? And, uh, all right? I'm going back there? Yeah. All right. You get overtime. <laughs> so he comes back and he does this. What I am proposing is something else in addition to this. What I am proposing that it was not the ancient Mayan culture that came up with scientific information, but rather the same UFO force from the Emeralds who had dispatched people all over the earth and some of them turned up in South America in the land of the Mayans. And it places a much greater emphasis on December the 21st, 2012. You know, I, I don't get really excited about prophecies made by ancient people. These guys were not ancient people. This was an advanced, this, these are people that flew in UFOs 30,000 years ago and had ray guns. Now, they're saying this. See? So, if indeed, this is the work of an alien force whose members include Jesus Christ rather than an ancient race from South America. We better look twice. <coughs> How about if I show you pretty good evidence that these guys from space also put together the Jewish Kabbalah? Thousands of years before there ever was a Jew. Thousands of years before there ever was an Israel. So I'm proposing these possibilities. It was not the skills of the Egyptians. It was not the skills of the Mayans. But it was the skills of the Emerald Force. Now, let me show you something uh, concerning the pyramids from the Emerald Tablet. I built the Great Pyramid, patterned, patterned after the Pyramid of Earth Force, being e burning eternally so that it too might remain through the ages. Joe? So we have a pyramid in Egypt which the uh, UFO guy said, I built it. So then, the guys from the UFO fan out all over the earth, and some of them show up in South America in the land of the Mayans. And what's the next thing we see? They built the pyramid. You know, remember before? One and one is two. Puzzle parts fit. They land, see, before Egypt was Egypt, and that's when the Emerald Force came, long before Egypt was Egypt, it was, they called it, the UFO guys called it the land of Chem, K-H-E-M. So they build pyramids. Then they show up, some of them show up 
in South America, and the next thing we know, we got them building pyramids. It doesn't prove anything, does it? No, but it's interesting, isn't it? And you want to call it a coincidence, or you want to say, eh, maybe something to this. It would appear to me that what we have been referring to as originating with the Egyptians and the Mayans may actually have been the work of the emerald force from another galaxy. Now let me show you something which I think seems to confirm this proposal, which I found in an email from a friend who really supports us here, whose name is Steve, and who lives in London, England. Let me show you Steve's email. He said, Bill, hope you're all well. Interesting recent video, thanks. And this is what he said. You said in your last video that there may have been some connection with the Mayan and Egypt. The Egyptologist Stephen Mailer, in his book, The Land of Osiris, suggests there are Mayan glyphs in a pyramid in Egypt. He also has a video on Google, Land of Osiris, about the 48-minute mark that speaks about this, take care, Steve. Well, when I saw that, my head started to ring because he said, there are Mayan glyphs in a pyramid in Egypt. But you know what I thought? Are they emerald glyphs that wound up in a pyramid in the land of the Mayans and then were called Mayan glyphs. In other words, what I'm saying, and glyphs, incidentally, are hieroglyphics, signs, symbols. What I'm saying, was it, when they built the pyramid, was it the UFO emerald force that put those hieroglyphs in there? And then they were also put into the pyramid in Maya by the same force and so people coming later saying, oh, look, at these are the Mayan glyphs. <sighs> so who's, where these symbols placed in an Egyptian pyramid by the Emerald Force and then placed in Maya by the same force? So I'm proposing that the symbols originated with the UFO force, the, Maya, uh, the Emerald Force, and not the Mayans, and not the Egyptians. So I went to the book, The Land of Osiris, by Stephen Mailer. And this is just a, a forward that I present to you, but it's really interesting. When you think of what we're dealing with, we're dealing with an alien force coming in UFOs with all this superb technological equipment. This guy, Stephen Mailer, was uh, doing archaeological investigations and so forth for 33 years. Joe, and this is what, what it says. The land of Osiris, Stephen Mailer. Listen to the questions. Was there an advanced prehistoric civilization in ancient Egypt? Not a prehistoric civilization an advanced prehistoric civilization. He never connects this to the emerald. He just says it looks like it was some kind of super advanced civilization. Were they the same people who built the Great Pyramid and carved the Great Sphinx? Now get this one. Did the pyramid serve as energy devices and not as tombs for kings? Independent Egyptologist Stephen Mellor has spent over 30 years researching the answers to these questions, and he believes the answers are yes. Yes, there was an advanced civilization, and who would they be? They would be the Emerald Force. Yes, they did make the pyramids and the Great Sphinx. Yes, the pyramids served as energy devices and not tombs for kings. Now, Let's look at that once more. Focus in with me. Did the pyramid serve as energy devices and not as tombs for kings? Let us go to the emerald tablet. Joan, this is what the emerald tablet says. Look on the left. I built the great pyramid patterned after the pyramid of earth force. 
burning eternally so that it too might remain through the ages. And look what Doc says. In it, I built my knowledge of magic science. What we would call today magic science would be advanced technology so that I might be here when again I return. So the Emerald Tablet says, yes, I built a pyramid, and in it, I built my knowledge of magic science, and Stephen Mailer said that the pyramids serve as energy devices and not tombs. So Stephen Mailer is saying, yes, they are some kind of advanced technological, and the Emerald Tablet of 30,000 said, in those pyramids, I built my knowledge of magic science, which would be advanced technology. So now we're making some heavy-duty connections. And the plot thickens. Can you imagine this? It thickens even to the very things that we celebrate. The emerald forces, the alien forces, fan out around the globe, some going to South America, the land of the Mayans, and in the Bible, we find them with their UFOs in Ezekiel. We find Elijah lifting off from the earth in a UFO, then returning as a character named John, who's a close personal friend of Jesus, who knows of this previous existence of John, and obviously knows he was an alien. And all of this, all of this started before there was a place known as Egypt. It didn't exist when all of this started. This obviously was the pre-ancient advanced civilization that Stephen Mailer is talking about. Now consider, they began their work in this area which is now Egypt. In that area, general area, Iran, Iraq, Egypt, all that Middle East stuff. Consider that Jesus and Elijah knew each other Consider them as, as members of the alien forces, the emerald force. And then, as Christmas draws on us once again, consider this stuff. You got this in your mind? Huh? He's part of the emerald force. They're in the land of Chem, Egypt. Okay? And Elijah and the spaceship and all of this. Look what it says in the Bible. Out of Egypt have I called my son. Well, you say, well, yeah, but they had to take him there to escape the king. Well, you know better than that. That's the duplicate of the Krishna and the, and the Zeus myth. Now, they, they, this, this says something very special. Out of Egypt have I called my son. And what? Did they call themselves messengers of the sun? Out of Egypt. You know, I often wondered about that. You know why I often wondered? Because we taught the Coptic key how many years ago? In the Gnostics of Egypt. And I often said, when the heck was Jesus in Egypt? I never remember any stories about him. How could he be given this to the Egyptians? Obviously. From the Emerald Forest, he was in Egypt before he went any place else. I remember, this emerald force was in that land before it became Egypt. The leader spoke the same words as Jesus, and he was pictured with a cross and a single eye, and the leader came from the city of eight, also the god of eight. Hermopolis is the site of ancient Qum. It's also known as K-H-E-M, Kem, and is located near the modern Egyptian town of al Ashumain. The ancient Egyptians name of the city, eight town after the Yagdad, of the eight deities who represented the world before creation. Hermopolis after Hermes. But I want you to concentrate on the city of eight, the eight deities. So the first thing we have to keep in mind is that the location of this story of UFOs Ray guns and aliens is connected to Eight Town, or City of Eight, named after a group of eight deities. So eight figures prominently here. The City of Eight was another title. 
Now the next we consider the Emerald Tablet. We've been through this before. And why is it called the Emerald Tablet? Because it's an octon. It has eight sides. See, so eight is important. It has eight sides. So with all this eight going on in Egypt, before it was Egypt, through the Emerald Force, and then we find this in the Coptic Key, when whoever this commander of this alien force who wound up being named Jesus in the Bible, he gives something to people in Egypt, which David Fiedler writes and calls the Coptic Key, and he said, this is the symbol, which is the sign of eight, which you see on the front of here. And we've had this on here for 20 years. I didn't know anything about aliens. I didn't know anything about emerald tablets. We didn't know any of that stuff. All we knew was the sign of eight. Hey, this must be something special. Oh, is it? The sign is the wheel of eight given by Jesus or whoever he was or whatever his name was when he got out of that UFO where the emerald forces were in the city of eight. Given by the same guy who knew the guy Elijah who had flown in the UFO and the same guy who the biblical statement said, out of Egypt I have called myself. So the evidence is at least very interesting. To me it is anyhow. Very interesting and compelling as to who we are. Who they are. And we have the promised return both of the emerald alien and Jesus Christ, who are obviously one and the same. Now, <clears throat> in order to continue this exercise, what I have to do is not consider the ancient mythologies as either Greek or Egyptian. We've all done that, right? Uh, this is Egyptian mythology. Oh, this is Roman mythology. Oh, this is Greek mythology. Oh. You can't consider the Bible as divine. You can't consider it as spiritual. You can't consider it as religious. But what you have to just do in order to get into this exercise is consider all of the instructions from all of these words, from all of these people, including Jesus, as directions from alien forces who came to this planet in UFOs. Long before there was any Bible, long before there was any Egypt, long before there was anything but a bunch of hairy barbarians running around. Your aunts and uncles, really. So you're left here to consider anything you want. You can say, oh, I think he's not still. I know a lot of people say that. <laughs> but you know what? Only when you accept that among you, living among you, are those from elsewhere and that your religion is simply a misunderstanding of alien forces from another galaxy, only then will you be able to lift yourself. Because otherwise you're going to spend the rest of your life showing up in church, singing a song and kneeling down or standing up or whatever you do. But you're not ever going to know. Because in order to know, you have to be open up to who these people who are among you are. The instructions from Jesus are alien. His closest friend came and left in a UFO. And Jesus then, what happened to him? He ascended, didn't he? He ascended. Well, he did according to their legend, but not a physical ascension. But did he ascend an advanced vehicle? Was it like this? And it came to pass while he blessed them, he was parted and carried up into heaven. And so there was nobody there that wrote this in the Bible. It just somebody, oh yeah, he ascended into heaven. How do you get up there? How do you get up there? Remember, this is just a story written on tales from ancient times by mythologists. The story said that Jesus' close friend flew up in a UFO, so wouldn't this suggest that he did too, whoever he was? Or would it be easier to picture him with a red cape? 
Did he go that way? And he was carried up into heaven. And as you can see with the crucifixion, he was ticked off. You see, which makes more sense to you? He didn't, it doesn't say, Albert, he disappeared. It said he was carried up into. So he either went that way or the UFO way. I choose the UFO. So it's a UFO or Superman, and you take your pick. Can you imagine sitting down in church and talking to people about it? They can't even consider. But the, the Bible said he was carried up into the sky. How? His friend went in the UFO. The key to all this information is summed up by the investigative work done for 33 years by Stephen Mailer and by Zachariah Sitchin as well. And as Mailer put it, was there an advanced prehistoric civilization? Were they people who built the pyramids? Did the pyramids serve as energy devices? And he says, yes. In other words, the prehistoric civilization means people who were far beyond the point where Earth people have evolved, have actually been operating in this area of the Earth before there was an Egypt. People who had come to this area with UFOs and laser weapons, and then spread out all over the Earth, wound up some of them in the Mayan culture, and we got the prophecy about Paco Votan and all that stuff. And what do we get from Paco Votan? What it, what, they showed us a picture. The Mayans carved a picture. And what is it of? A guy in a spaceship. I mean, come on. Don't look at me. They could have had a picture of a guy planting flowers or whittling. No, he's in a spaceship. To me, that's hot stuff. So we have Jesus saying the same thing along with the cross out of Egypt. So given all of this, is it not curious that the entire Bible is then written where? Israel? No. England? No. Greece? No. Written in the land of Chem, Egypt, under the direction of Alexander the Great, whoever he might have been. He was wiping everybody out, and uh, for all we know, those ray guns might have been firing. I don't know. So the land of Chem is present-day Egypt, and that's the land mentioned in the Emerald Tablet, and the land of Chem is where the Bible was written, Old and New Testament, in Alexandria. Isn't that interesting? The Emerald Force comes in a UFO to the land of Chem, which is now Egypt, and the Bible, which talks about UFOs, was also written in the land of Chem, which is now Egypt. You remember from this initial report from uh, the Emerald when the force commander uh, gives uh, orders for the Emerald Force to leave that other galaxy and come here. What does it say? Gather together, my people. Take them by the arch you have learned until you reach the land of the hairy barbarians who dwell in caves and follow the plan that you know of. And it says, we entered the great ship and upward we rose. In other words, lift off. Fast we fled towards the sun of the morning until finally beneath us was the land of the children of Chem. Can you imagine this Captain Kirk? Oh, there they are, man. Look at this guy. He's coming at you with a rock. See? Remember that? I want you to concentrate on the line finally beneath us. See that last line? Was the land of the children of Chem. This is one the... Emerald Force initially arrived in UFOs. Beneath them were the people they called children of Chem. So the word Chem originated with the Emerald Force. That's when it was first used. Later became now what we know as Egypt. Now in addition, Chem became an Egyptian god. It's spelled like that. Became an Egyptian god. So one has to presume that the Egyptian god Chem 
referred to the leader of the Emerald UFO Four. Folks, I mean, you got to you, think of this. Right? I know you go to church and you God and angels, and, but you got to think. You're talking about thousands of years ago when people who spent their life chiseling rocks and selling sheep are seeing guys with ray guns and UFOs. They're all gods. Who is God? Anybody that can fly in a UFO? Oh, you want it? You could go into the jungle with a, a cell phone and you become God. See? In Greek mythology, I know Ethel is interested in Greek mythology, Chem was known as Pan. And Chem was also identified. And this is very, very significant. Think again. Chem, origin, the emerald force from the UFOs over 30,000 years ago. John? Chem was the Egyptian god of reproduction and human fertility as well as the Egyptian father god. In the Bible, he is called Ham. Okay? Now, look at, what do you say at the end of every prayer? Amen. Amen or Amen Ra represented standing and wearing a flat cap with two plumes or as the mummy seated with the same headdress, holding the scepter in crook when he is Amen Osiris. He is also found identified with many other gods as Amen Chem. So when you're saying Amen, you are continuing the words of Captain Kirk and Dr. Spock, who came 30,000 years ago in their UFOs. Wouldn't that be nice to say, Amen, Ken? The guy's liable to come right through the wall. <laughs> see? I mean, how much can you... Do you see this? How clear can it be? It's only some guy criticizes, I don't put enough of the... I thought we did pretty good giving credit to scientists and, and where we get this stuff from. We said, well, no, you got to put it right. So I put it there. So go ahead. on. Chem, first mentioned in the Emerald by the alien forces, finds its way into the Bible under the name Ham. And note that the god Amen, you say, is also con called Amen Chem. So we have Chem from the UFO aliens becoming Amen Chem. We have Jesus as a friend with Elijah who flew in a UFO. But what else do we find about Jesus? What is Jesus called in the book of Revelation? Are you with me here? And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans, write this thing, say the Amen. He might have been the guy in the spaceship. Oh no, he was the guy in the spaceship. These things say the Amen. Amen is also identified as Amen Kim. I mean, if you don't want me to get involved in this stuff, don't have this be true, but it is. I can't help that. <laughs> How We've shown Jesus connected to the alien Elijah and the UFO. We've shown him connected to uh, the Coptic key and Egypt, out of Egypt and all of this stuff. We've shown him saying the same things as Toth. And now he's known as Amen. And the ancient Egyptian work connects Amen to Kem which was the word of the UFO aliens. This then would definitely connect Jesus with Kem. And you know what? To me, that doesn't diminish him at all. It raises him because now, when you listen to the Emerald Tablet, it is Jesus talking. You can go back in 688 and 689, which are the uh, other DVDs I did, and compare the words of Toth and Jesus as well as the picture of Toth with the cross and the single. So we connect all of this. We connect the Bible itself. And science, and historically, the Bible is written in the land of Chem, which is Egypt. 
But what about the Greeks? Our, what about the Greeks? They, they were running this show. It was written in Alexandria, Egypt, but it was under the Ptolemies. They reported to Alexander the Great. See, if you look to find the origins of a Greek culture, you know what you do? Now, I don't mean you go back to all the earliest Greeks. No, no, no. You go back and you find out who were the people that came there before it was Greece. Who were they? Do you know who they were? They were called Palestians. Palestians. They came from somewhere and started this place called Greece. The Palestians were the earliest known beings to occupy what is now called Greece long before the Hellenists who actually wrote the Bible. But where did the Palestinians come from before they founded what is now Greece? Because I would like to find that out. All right. The name Palestinians was used by ancient Greek writers to refer to populations that preceded the Hellenes in Greece as a whole term for any ancient primitive people. Archaeologists excavating at Sesquili and Dimini have described Palestinian material culture as Neolithic. The Neolithic Age, or Stone Age, was a period in the development of human technology beginning in the Middle East. Which means the Palestinians who came into Greece and then wrote the Bible came from the land of Ken. But let's pursue it a little bit further because I see you sitting there wondering, oh, yeah, well, it's easy for him to say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where in the Middle East did this Neolithic culture was started? Where did the Palestinians really come from? In the Tigris and Euphrates river valleys, the Neolithic culture of the Middle East developed into the urban civilizations of the Bronze Age between so and so. Neolithic culture spread through Europe. The Tigris and Euphrates. Here's Iraq, here's Syria, here's Egypt, here's Saudi Arabia, here's the Euphrates, and there's the Tigris. That's the land of Chem. That's where the UFOs landed, and that's where the force that set out from the Emerald Force, some of them wound up in South America and became what you call Mayans. Others wrote the Bible and became what you call Aristotle. Did you ever wonder how come those guys knew so much? Now you know. How long have we asked that question? I always wondered that. Everybody else is selling sheep and splitting rocks, and in some neighborhood they've got all these guys that know everything in the world. How's it possible? Greek scientists, philosophers, they were so far ahead of the world. Where'd they come from? What were these people doing? These Palestinians come in, they found this place called Greece, all of a sudden we get a bunch of guys with funny names, but they notice stuff. Look at John. Aristarch. He's in scientific plotting of the universe. What is this all about? Arasta, an astronomer, measured the Earth's circumference. Eudoxus, he's an astronomer. Heraclides explained the rotation of the Earth. Herop, a physician, brain specialist. Hipparchus founded trigonometry, discovered the possession of the equinoxes, calculated the length of the year to within six and a half minutes. Next. Hippocrates, father of medicine, first to attribute disease to environment and not God, stressed diet, insisted his students study astrology, said he who doesn't understand astrology is not a doctor but a fool. Pythagoras measured the Earth's circumference, reincarnation, transmigration, numerology, con Pythagorean theorem and harmony in the universe, string theory of the harmony of the spheres. Democritus, matter is made up from atoms. This guy was an atom scientist, please. Atoms are always moving. Socrates, philosophy and ethics, doing what one thinks is right. 
Zeno, quantum physics, the universe contains a divine artesian fire which foresees an extending from complete. But now we know, don't we? They came across from the land of Chem and were part of the Emerald Force. There had to be some explanation, didn't there? How could these people know everything and nobody else in the whole world knew a damn thing? How? Because they came from up there, down here. I finally know. See? And this doesn't even include Aristotle and Plato. But you know what's so amazing about this? Right here in front of your eyes, we have been able to draw a dotted line from Greece to where these people originated in the land of Chem, where they came in UFOs. And now we can read the Bible, not as a religious book, but as a book of instructions from an advanced race who came to earth in UFOs. Can you understand Jesus as part of the Emerald Force? Does that bother you? Why? What does he have to be? He has to fly like Superman or disappear. He can't be part of the Emerald Force. Can we understand Pachel Votan as part of the Emerald Force making this 2012 thing? I can. It's all the same force that came from 4550. You know, as we look at the Emerald Tablet, we see a comment that is not unlike those made by Pakal Votan concerning 2012. And what he talked about was a failure to follow in harmony and respect nature and harmonize with nature. And, and this is what the Emerald Tablet said, beware men of Chem. In other words, you people down here, if you have falsely betrayed my teaching, for I will cast you down from your highest state into the darkness of the cave from where you came. In other words, you're not spending all this time trying to straighten you people out and show you what the hell to do. And if you're going to screw everything up again, you're going right back into the crap where you came from. And guess what it says in Psalms? They know not, neither will they understand. They walk in darkness and all the foundations of the earth are out of course. So you got Al Gore saying, well, it's global warming. Well, that's what they said, too. And this scientist at John Hopkins said, we're going to have a plague because of factory farming. It's a disrespect for nature. But it was said 30,000 years ago, and this guy said, hey, if you people go back and you do the same old things, we're not going to bail you out. The point is, how would we betray the teaching? <clears throat> These teachings don't <coughs> specifically warn about being kind to nature, about flowing in harmony. But you know what? Being kind to nature and flowing in harmony is a direct result of meditation. It's a direct result of the meditative state once you start to activate that true light within yourself. When one flows in meditative harmony, you're flowing with nature. So, as you can see in the book of Psalms, there's a direct reference to nature. The, the foundations of the earth are out of course. And why? Because the human mind is in darkness, and that's what it says. So the Emerald Force provides the teaching to bring people out of darkness into the light, which will also have the effect of correcting people who damage nature. Paco Votan was also part of the same Rimmel Force. He concluded the Earth would suffer a great shaking because of the loss of our interdependence with nature. And you know what it is? Human beings seem to be possessed of a need to follow the crowd. And we do. And that places you in bondage to the system. And that's, I mean, I, I've told you this many times. When I was a little kid, I was thrown out of a religious school. I, I, I told them, I, didn't, I don't think you're right about it. And I had religious people surrounding me saying, we're frightened of you. I, I don't know what. Whatever it may be, people keep following the system. Religion, government, family, friends, anything. I got to be part of the crowd. Both the Emerald Force and the Bible, which really are the same, address this in this way. 
the emerald far in a past time, lost in space-time, the children of light looked down on the world. Seeing the children of men in their bondage, they knew that only by freedom from bondage could men ever rise from the earth to the sun. And Galatians, but now after you have known God, or rather are known of God, how do you turn again to the weak and beggarly elements where you desire again to be in bondage? What happened? How did the alien force work with the earth people to try and move them into a harmony with the higher light? Look at this. Down we descended. Here they come and created bodies, you ready for this one? Taking the semblance of men as our own. In other words, we look like you. We are they who were formed from the space dust, partaking of life from the infinite all, living in the world as children of men, like and yet unlike the children of men. Revelation 7.15, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple and he that sits on the throne shall dwell among them. They're here. Look. So you have the emerald, you have the Bible talking about alien forces living among you, teaching you, working to assist you in overcoming the darkness. The emerald in a more direct alien approach, the Bible impresses us as religious, but indeed they're speaking of these alien forces being here. The point being is that there are among you those from the emerald force who are on earth and not only work to change the destructive, destructive direction of earth forces, but who report back to the higher eight. Now, yeah, I, I, I don't know whether I've got... What is the next one that you've got there, John? Good, thank you. I, I'm missing that there. I want everybody, if you're falling asleep during any of this, wake up now, because i got something important to show you. And it's through me. So I had to do a little light focusing. This is the emerald. 32 were there of the children, sons of lights, who had come among men seeking to free them from the bondage of darkness. 32 guys. Can you imagine 32 guys getting off the ship? They placed in the center a ray of great power, life-giving, filling with power all who came near it. 32 places for each of the children of light, placed so that they were bathed in the radiance and filled with the life from the eternal light. Remember, these 32 came before there was an Egypt, before there was anything. Look at it again. How many? 32. 32. There is a rabbi by the name of Pinson, Rabbi Pinson. And he wrote a book about Kabbalah of the ancient Hebrews. And I want to show you the cover of that book. It's called The 32 Gates of Wisdom. The Kabbalah. The tree of life is formed from 32 paths. 10 objective paths known as the Sifra, 22 subjective that connect pairs of Sifra together. 32 gates of wisdom, the Kabbalah, Jewish, the emerald, 32 places for each of the children of light placed so that they were bathed in radiance from the eternal light. Obviously, the Kabbalah as well came from the emerald forces from the UFO. I mean, how, couldn't it be 16 or 27 or anything? Did it have to be the exact same thing? Certainly. It's where it came from. 
So what are we thinking here? 32 aliens, 32 children of light. In the history of Kabbalah, no one is quite sure where the 32 paths originated. You will never find it. But you know what? You know. Would common sense not demand that the 32 paths of wisdom originated with the Emerald Force 32 Children of Light? Of course. Thank you, and we'll see you soon. Bye-bye.